I'm Joseph Mintzlarge, Katie Christian Magazine. We just want to invite you to our next uh, chamber breakfast meeting. Special speaker to be announced. So you're going to have to go to katiechristianchamber.com. Uh, go to upcoming breakfast and register. We're the only Christian chamber of its kind in the greater Houston area. Our mission is to connect Christ and businesses, okay? And we need you there to accomplish that. So go to katiechristianchamber.com or always put it on your recurring schedule the third Friday of each month. God bless. Hope to see you next month. Thank you. Have fun. I see Joe. Everybody knows who Dr. Noel Frank is. He was the weatherman on Channel 11 for 20 plus years. Even if you watch the other news stations, Channel 2, 11, 13, uh, or Channel 2 or 13, you'd always turn to Channel 11 for the news. And prior to that, Dr. Frank was also the director of the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. And we're very honored to have him as our speaker today. I appreciate the opportunity of coming and sharing with you, and it seems like to me that uh, since this freeze in um, February was a meteorological event, that maybe we ought to say a word about that. All right, and, and in order to do that, let me introduce you to an astronaut. You know, um, NASA is doing some great things, and one of their priorities is the life of the astronaut. Let me tell you. I believe that the life of every Texan is just as precious as the astronaut. And there is absolutely no excuse for 200 deaths in a freeze that is predictable and is preventable. Now let me show you what happened in that freeze. This shows the time scale starting in uh, February the 14th. A big Arctic front right out of the North Pole come plunging into Texas and the temperature began to drop on uh, Sunday night and it snowed and we got up Monday morning to a sea of white. The temperature never got above freezing and then the power went off. And then the temperature dropped down to 11 degrees, about 10 degrees here in the Katy area and never rose above freezing until Wednesday afternoon. So what happened? Well, the generators failed. Uh, all these wind turbines, they froze over. That's predictable. We know that any time the temperature goes below freezing and you got a lot of moisture, these wind turbines are going to freeze over. Now, the surprise was the natural gas generators failed. Now, it's my understanding that the natural gas generators themselves didn't fail, and there was plenty of natural gas, but to move the natural gas from the source to the generator, required electricity and when the electricity went off we had a disaster now how do we correct that well we would winterize this whole thing i think you can winterize the natural gas it's expensive but i believe that it can be done how do you winterize a wind turbine i don't know but let's assume you can do that all right now we've solved the problem we can move on with the current administrator's agenda to have more green energy. And by the, thousand, by the year 2030, 50% of the energy of the electricity in the United States will be produced by green energy. The only way you can get to that goal is to have more wind turbines. So let's say by 2030 that 50% of our energy, our, of our electricity is generated by wind turbines. Let me tell you a deep, dark secret. When the heart of the cold air sits right over you, no there's no wind. You may have three days with no wind. Can you imagine thousands of people who are driving electric cars pulling in to get their cars charged? There's no wind and there's no energy. Well, at least in February, you could get in your gas-driven car and drive around the block and warm up or go down to Bucky's and get a warm sandwich. That wouldn't be possible with no energy. And you can say, well, this was a rare event. It'll never occur again. We've had eight of those events in the last 125 years. 89 was the most recent event, and the temperature went down to 7 degrees. Do you know what? We only lost energy for the portion of one day. Do you know why? There was no wind turbines and natural gas was just coming into favor. I also point out that there was another 
major event in 83. So an average of uh, once every 15 years, 15 years is magic. You can have one event following another, another quickly. So if we had another freeze like February, we would have another disaster because of no wind energy. Now you've been lied to. You've been told that fossil fuels are bad because they generate carbon dioxide. And this evil pollutant up there is going to cause the earth to warm up and we're going to have astronomical meteorological events. <clears throat> Mark Levin wrote an interesting book called Unfreedom of the Press. He says you can brainwash people when you have an event that is not scientifically valid by doing three things. First of all, you can lie to them. Number two, you can omit, omit certain things. And number three, you can use propaganda. And I point out that propaganda is effective in terms of fear and in terms of emotion. So when you're lied to, it creates fear. So let's look at these events that are allegedly uh, going to happen. Now keep in mind that carbon dioxide didn't just start yesterday. We've been seeing increasing in carbon dioxide for 75 years. If any one of these events was going to take place in the future, we would already see it occurring. So let's talk about droughts. The droughts indicate that you'll have a long period of very hot temperature. Well, one way that you can indicate that is to look at the number of days that weather stations report temperatures in excess of 95 degrees from June to August. Starting in 1920 and going over to the current, is it any surprise that the peak occurred during the Dust Bowl years in the 30s? There was another peak in the 52s. And let me tell you, the droughts that we're seeing now, currently, uh, do not compare with the Dust Bowl years. Now, all the drifts you see there, they're not snow drifts. These are dirt drifts and the dreaded summer week. How about increasing wildfires? That's what you're being told with all these wildfires and the one in the West at the present time. Well, this shows the history of wildfires since 1926, the acreage that is being burned by wildfires. Now, in the, before World War II, it was a major problem. Then in World War II, all of a sudden things got better. And I talked with foresters and I said, well, what happened? I said, well, we initiated some very effective programs and it saved our forest. But notice here in 1980 that we're beginning to see a trend back in the damage by wildfires. That's because we've abandoned some of these programs. Or how about sea level rise in New York City by 2000, by, by 2100 and Galveston Island will be underwater. Well, we've been tracking the history of the rise in sea level for 150 years. And it's rising at the rate of eight inches per century. Eight inches per century. Eight inches is not going to flood New York City and Galveston Island. Oh, how about the warmest temperatures? You've been reading about that with the Earth has never been this hot, right? Look at this editorial that appeared in the AP at the end of last year. Last decade by far was the hottest ever measured on Earth, capped by the second warmest year on record. It would lead you to believe that the Earth has never been hotter than this, right? Ah, the key word is measured. Measured means a temperature that was determined by a thermometer or a weather station. And that record only goes back to 1880. And I don't even know why they started the records in 1880. This is the number of weather stations that existed in 1885. Look at the southern hemisphere. There's nothing down there at all. What was the temperature of the earth in 1885 is determined by weather stations. It's very questionable. That's why the record, the historical record, of the temperature of the earth is very questionable. <clears throat> now there's other ways that we can determine the temperature of the earth. We don't have to have a thermometer. For example, if you drill down two miles, you can determine the temperature of the earth back 800,000 years. And what we find is that there's a cycle in the earth's temperature. We have 100,000 years of, of ice ages separated by a 10,000 year warm period. This shows the record of the temperature of the earth for the last 
four ice ages, 400,000 years. The little pink peaks at the top, that's the 10,000 year warm period. Look way to the right. We're living in the coldest warm period of the last four ice ages. Or let's take a look at the temperature over the last 10,000 years. And what we see is a cycle. Every thousand years, the earth is warm. Way on the right, that's where we are at the present time. I told you that the temperature has been warming for the last 150 years. That's not debatable. That's where you see it right on the right. But a thousand years ago, the temperature was warmer than today. They farmed in England for some 400 years. 2,000 years during the time of Christ, it was warmer than today. 3,000 years, it was warmer. Look over here at seven and 8,000. The temperature of the earth over the last 8,000 years has decreased some two to three degrees centigrade. We're living in the coldest portion of the last 10,000 years. Now we are warming in the last 150 years. I'm delighted that we are warming. I don't want to go back to the good old days when Washington was in Valley Ford or when they had winter carnivals on the frozen Thames River in, in Europe and literally a million of people died because of crop failures. How about increasing storms? Well, let's start out with tornadoes. A violent tornado is defined as one with winds of 160 miles an hour. This shows the history of violent tornadoes for the, since 1950. Notice way over on the right, 2018 was the first year in recorded records that we did not have a violent tornado. How about uh, hurricanes? Oh, we're going to see increasing number and increasing strength. The bottom graph shows the history of hurricane type storm. Typhoons in the Pacific, cyclones in Australia and, uh, and uh, down in New Zealand. And you can see that there's a downward trend. There's been a 5 to 10% decrease in this kind of storm worldwide. We get about 50 of those type of storms every year. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see, well, the, um, the evidence, I don't see some of the blue lines here. This shows the trends of the landfall of major hurricanes that have hit the United States. In terms of the Atlantic, the only indication of the long-term trend in hurricanes is look at the landfall of major hurricanes. That would be the three, fours, or five, or ones that would have winds in excess of 130 miles an hour. And you can see the trend is downward, and since the 1940s and the 50s, it is way downward. Now you see, that's not consistent with last year. We had 30 named storms. <laughs> okay, That's a new record. And surely this must be global warming that is causing this increase in storm. No, that's not true. Uh, I'm sorry that some of, the, uh, some of the colors are not showing up very well in this. Uh, I don't know why that's true, Erica. I, I don't know why you're not seeing some of these colors. This shows the hurricanes in 2005. Prior to 2020, we had 28 storms in 2005. I've drawn a vertical line that shows the eastward extent of the reconnaissance plane over here in the United States. So the reconnaissance planes did not go over into the eastern Atlantic. And beyond that is the eastern Atlantic. And there were seven hurricanes over there. In 1933, we had 21 named storms. Prior to 2005, this was the most active hurricane period. Look at this in the eastern Atlantic. Not one hurricane was registered there. You can't tell me that you had 21 storms in the, in the western Atlantic and nothing occurred in the eastern Atlantic. So if we take a look, we find out that before satellites, we were naming only one storm per year in the eastern Atlantic. After satellites, it's two to three storms. But more important that we are naming storms today that we did not name some years ago. And in order to explain that, I need to tell you a little bit about hurricanes form. Hurricanes require a pre-existing disturbance. The disturbance causes thunderstorms. Thunderstorms heat the air. Heat rises and the air spins in at the bottom and if the winds at the bottom reach threshold, we name them. Now in the deep tropics, south of 25 degrees north, that would be the latitude of Brownsville in Miami, the most important factor in terms of the pre-existing disturbances is African disturbances. We follow 40 to 50 of these a year. 
You did not know, but there is one in the Atlantic, there is one in the Gulf, there is one in the Caribbean, there is one approaching the islands of the Eastern Caribbean, there is one in the Central Atlantic, and there's one just emerging from Africa. You don't know that because the people are not talking about it on the air. All they're talking about is the dust. Every one of those dust plumes that you see on it is caused by an African disturbance. So in terms of the 40 to 50, some 10 or more of these become named storms. And Hurricane Ike in, 19, in 2005 was an example of the storm that emerged from Africa. Now in the North Atlantic, it is entirely different. What you see is a cold front that moves off the coast, it stalls, and a disturbance forms along that front. And this is not tropic, but it does cause thunderstorms. And these thunderstorms can begin to cause some heat, and this system can kind of morph into something that looks tropical. We didn't used to name these things. Now we're naming them. Every one of those little short green lines represents something that formed. We named it, and then we denamed it because the thunderstorm disappeared. We named 10 of those storms last year, and 11, if you include the one in the Gulf of Mexico, already this year, we've named four of these. So a lot of the 30 storms came because of this uh, effect. In 1933, when we had the la that active hurricane season, not one storm was named that way in the North Atlantic. So I took a look at the record for the last 75 years, before satellites in the North Atlantic, we were naming one storm every two years. Now it's up to four storms a year, and last year it was 10, and already we're up to four. So I'm telling you that the 30 storms is a misconception. And some PhD from MMIT is going to take a look at the records and say, aha, uh -huh, 30 storms, this has got to be global warming. You've been lied to. And what about last year when we had three hurricanes hit in uh, 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 Louisiana? Never had anything like that happen. Yeah, yes, we did. In 1886, we had four hurricanes make landfall in Texas. One of those destroyed Indianola, a thriving seaport in, Matag in the south shore of Matagorda Bay, and three hurricanes made landfall in Florida me, that same year. How about omission? When was the last time anybody emphasized to you that carbon dioxide is a very minor, minor, minor gas. It's not 4% of the atmosphere. It's not 0.4% of the atmosphere. It's 0.04% of the atmosphere. Now let's put that in perspective. The football stadium at Dallas holds 100,000 people. If you assign a molecule to air to every one of those seats, you'd have 70,000 nitrogen seats. You'd have 20,000 oxygen seats. You'd have 40. Uh, carbon dioxide heats. I don't think 40 seats are going to control the atmosphere in the football stadium during the football game. Nor do I believe that 0.04% of the atmosphere is going to control the global temperatures. How about the poor correlation between carbon dioxide and the temperature? Now at the top of the graph you see the temperature of the earth for the last 10,000 years. At the bottom of the graph you see the carbon dioxide levels that correspond to that. If carbon dioxide was causing the Earth's temperature, you should see spikes down here that correspond to those spikes up there. They're not there. As a matter of fact, what you find is that when the carbon dioxide levels were low, the temperatures were high, and when the carbon dioxide levels increased, the temperatures decreased. That's just the opposite of what you're being told. How about taking a look at the last uh, 150 years? What we find is that the Earth's temperature is, goes in a 60-year cycle. The Earth warms for 30 years, and then it cools for 30 years. The black line indicates the warm and the cooling. The red and the yellow indicate the carbon dioxide levels. Please note that the only direct correlation between carbon dioxide and temperatures occur over there in the 80s and the 90s. So the, for the last 10,000 years, there's only been a 20 year period when there was good correlation between carbon dioxide and the Earth's temperature. And let me tell you, correlation doesn't mean cause and effect. 
So 20 years over the last 10,000 is going to justify a multi-trillion dollar international program. One estimate would say, uh, who's the uh, gal from New York that has the green energy? Her 10 year period, once somebody estimated it would cost 20 and, and 92 billion and trillion dollars. 92 trillion dollars. And I saw in this agenda that has been proposed that we're going to have money to uh, put insulation in buildings. We're going to have all kinds of things. Trillions of dollars on the basis of a 20 year correlation. <clears throat> okay, if we take a look at the uh, oh, the temperature over the last uh, over the last uh, two decades hasn't changed and carbon dioxide continues to increase. So over there on the right, you can see the temperature there is about the temperature here. Uh, the little picture of annual years. I don't know why the temperature of the earth is warm down in, during El Nino years, but it is. And when's the last time that anyone emphasized that carbon dioxide is a miracle gas? It is not a pollutant, and without carbon dioxide, all plants die. If the carbon dioxide levels ever drop below 150, all plants die. Currently, it is 400. And in the last 10,000 years, it has hovered in the 200, uh, 200 parts per million. That's just above the threshold. For death. Do you know that nurseries that can control their environment pump the carbon dioxide levels up to 1,200? The current levels is 400 because they get more efficient growth. The best in, in the satellite pictures would indicate that there has been a 20 to 30 percent increase in the greening of the planet because of carbon dioxide. This is the Sahara Desert. They've lost 10 percent of their area because of greening along the southern flank. Mm. The best example that I can show you of the impact of carbon dioxide is this professor who planted four trees in carbon dioxide levels where he could control the carbon dioxide level. On the left hand side, that's about current levels, 385, that's 400 parts per million. Let's double carbon dioxide and you can see that there is a 100% increase in the growth of that plant. Now, <clears throat> he also took a look at 45 plants that feed 95% of the earth and he said let's double carbon dioxide and he found that, that, over 50, that most of those plants had a 50% increase in growth some of them up to 85, you can convert that into dollar values. And when he did, he said if carbon dioxide doubles in its, in its concentration, it would add $10 trillion to the agricultural committee. <laughs> so what is the optimum level of carbon dioxide? Would trees have a solution to that? Buy more SUVs? And how about propaganda? I told you the propaganda because of fear. That's what the line does. That creates fear. And how about the emotion? And bringing a little girl from, from uh, Sweden forward. She's the one that proposed that every Friday that students walk out of class and protest the fact that the, uh, the nation isn't doing enough about global warming. She was invited to speak before the United Nations. Can you imagine that? This is incredible that she was allowed to speak. She spoke before our own Congress. And because of that, Time Magazine recognized her as the person of the year. Wonder if anyone has told her that in Sweden, the temperature has dropped three degrees centigrade over the last 8,000, excuse me, 8,000 years. So what is the, uh, the reason uh, that she spoke there is because of her position on global warming. Do you know that at the same day she spoke there, the United Nations uh, Secretary General had in his hand a letter signed by 500 prominent scientists. Any one of these had the credentials to speak before the entire group of the United Nations, saying there's no climate emergency. 2019, there were 440 papers published internationally, challenged the hypothesis that carbon dioxide is not a major cause of global warming.
Not one of those papers was published in the United States. China is all over the sun as being the cause. Somebody recently went back to 1970 and found out there had been 79 predictions that had been made. Time has allowed us to verify 48 of those, and they've all proven false. What about the other 31 that are yet to be verified? There's no reason to believe that any one of those would be true. So what is the really motivation behind the global warming controversy? <clears throat> this is Morris Strong. He's a millionaire out of Canada. This is a statement that he made at the first uh, conference on global warming in Rio de Janeiro, Janeiro in 1992. It's the only hope for the planet that the industrial civilizations collapse. Mm. Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? Another senior United Nations official says, we distribute the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that the international climate policy is an environmental issue. This is the real purpose behind this whole continent. It's international redistribution of wealth, whose wealth, that would be our wealth, and the establishment of one world government. There's no question in my mind but what the global warming contribution is a demonic, inspired, anti-God, Marxist philosophy that is designed to destroy this beautiful, capitalistic, Judeo-Christian society. Appreciate it. I'm going to have you hang on to the mic or we can pass it around. Al Gore. What do you think about Al Gore? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he invent the internet? No comment. <laughs> uh, that he's heavy in carbon trading. Yeah. Wow. Anyone have a yeah, question? Yeah, heavy comments. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when Al Gore left the White House, he was worth $2 million. He invested in 14 green energy companies that were subsidized by the federal government for two and a half billion dollars. He may be a billionaire today. Yeah. I had a question. So, so in the Bible, the Lord says to subdue the earth, and it seems like this is the opposite of that. That's right. Is that, okay. Exactly. And I'll just ask by myself, what's been causing all the massive amount of rain that we've been getting over the last <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely it has nothing to do with global warming. We have weather patterns that get established and then they're hard to move. At the same time, we are wet, they are hot and dry in the northwest. This pattern has got to change. Uh, I, my question to you, would you rather be wet or would you rather be hot and dry? I'd rather be wet. You have to water the yard and the air conditioning bills are cutting out. <laughs> Anybody else? Anyone on this side have a question? I have a question. Oh, yes. It's real quick. Well, for the other side of the house, I'm going to give you the mic. Uh, what is the best book that you would recommend that would counter the global warming movement? I have over 30 books in my library that are written by extremely qualified, um, very qualified skeptics. Um, let me get back to you on that. Okay. I can give you a list. Um, but they're, but they're just a number that are just extremely, extremely good. Uh, just so everybody knows in the room, uh, when he sends me that list, I will e-blast it to all of you. Yeah. Uh, you guys all registered with your email. Everybody's going to get an email with that attachment. And yeah. um, a thank you for mm -hmm. Yes. We have time for one more question. Actually, yeah, this is not to offend anybody. This is just like a joke, OK? So <laughs> uh, I've been told that there is only one job in this world that can be completely wrong and still keep the job, and that's the job of a meteorologist. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> no, they finally fired me because I've been wrong for 50 years. <laughs> it's, it's time we bring these young people in that know what's going on. <laughs> All right, everybody give a round of applause to Dr. Frank.